So welcome everyone. Uh, we have the privilege of being here with Bob Anderson, who was actually the, the plant manager, is that correct? Correct. At the time when the original, uh, what we call less, the lean um, uh, environment simulator was developed at General Motors, which they called the SWE, um, simulated work environment. And uh, so we have the privilege of having Bob here, who's gonna tell us a little bit about himself, his background, and also how the SWE came about, and then also just some other items that, uh, that he'd, he'd share with us. So Bob, if you wanna tell us just a little bit of background on yourself, that would be, that'd be great. Well, uh, grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. My, my dad worked in the steel industry, had the opportunity to go to a co-op school. It was called General Motors Institute at the time, now Kettering University in Flint. Uh, co-op education was wonderful. We alternated six weeks of school, six weeks of work. I uh, started at the Lordstown plant that had just opened in the Youngstown area there in 1966. Uh, got a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, master's degree in industrial management. Spent 35 years in the auto industry. Uh, have managed plants in three countries and three languages. Had the opportunity to travel literally around the world uh, for training experiences. Uh, had the opportunity to retire uh, at a rather young age after 35 years and was still interested in sharing the next generation of leaders uh, with the lean experience and taught at the University of Michigan for 10 years Okay, in the College of Engineering to hopefully not let everybody reinvent the wheel like many of us had. Yeah, there you involved with uh, Dr. Jeff Liker. Yep, Jeff correct? Liker was, was yeah. actually the, the professor okay. that uh, was overseeing the class that I taught. Yeah, yeah a, lot of our, a lot of people that may watch this probably have read a lot of Jeff's, Jeff's uh, literature and yeah. books that he's yeah. written over the years. Yeah, and, uh, Mike Rother's book uh, on value stream mapping was one of, the, yeah. one of the texts we used in the book, or in the class. Uh, and then retired 10 years ago for good. Uh, just working in charities and that. Uh, my wife and I live on an island in Lake Michigan, Beaver Island, yeah. and winter down here in Indianapolis to be near our son and his family. Uh, it's been an adventure and a, and a wonderful life experience, being yeah. able to experience different cultures in, in a number of different countries and, and people and seeing how the industries e evolved. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic. I think, I think when we maybe spoke brief, briefly yeah. before, you told me about, I think, a story. I think it was at the Lord's down plant. Oh, my first work experience. Yeah, your first work experience. So that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, it, it might fit later when we're talking about how we introduce people to the to the plant environment that the simulated work environment was intended to replicate. But the the experience was you worked on the assembly line. The the, the goal was that you understood how vehicles went together from the ground up, even though you're getting an engineering degree or a business degree. And the first day on the job was literally had not been in the plant, had never been through the manufacturing environment, had just been an interview in the administration building. Uh, so the personnel coordinator gave me to the body shop superintendent who walked me down this long hall out into the plant and I was just spellbound seeing this <laughs> massive half mile long building. Walked me back through the maze where I, Naively, I'm wondering, what are all these cars painted silver for? I've never seen, <laughs> growing up in Youngstown, you never saw steel that clean. It was just all the, the bare metal bodies that were being assembled. He gave me the general foreman who took me through more of the maze in the body shop, and I got back in the underbody assembly area to the foreman who, by the time I got to him, I wasn't a trainee that was supposed to learn the jobs because I was in the first year of the cycle of these co-op experiences. Most people had no idea what it was. Uh, to him, I was another warm body and he was short people <laughs> that day. So he took me back to an area that was a, a Firebird F car uh, shelf subassembly area, where it was the rear shelf underneath the back window. You put two hinges on it. You said this is the Firebird? Firebird, and yeah. It was the first year of the Firebird. Okay. It was 1967. Oh, wow. Well, I would like to have been so, there. Yeah. So it was the rear shelf assembly, two hinges, uh, two torque rods that had rubber anti-squeak uh, sleeves on them and he said okay kid here's what you do you take this thing and you throw it in this the welding press put it in here you take two of these you flip them over it was the hinges you set them like that you, you take this stuff and you dip it in this bucket with chlorothane right I mean now you don't even breathe this stuff but we dipped it with cloth gloves in to get it so it would slide onto the torque rod you snap these in here push these two buttons the machine goes ka-chunk ka-chunk you take it out and you throw it down there any questions and he was gone <laughs> and it was like 
oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at all these sparks flying around and had no idea where I was. I thought, oh, I'm gonna die. What am I doing here? I'm never <laughs> gonna make it to college. I'll never get out of here alive. And fortunately for me, a committeeman, alder and a committeeman from the maintenance department was over working in the next bay and had watched all of this. And he walked over and he said, hey kid, do you need some help? I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. He said, here, <laughs> let me show you. So, I mean, he was familiar enough with the job. As it turned out, it wasn't even half a job. You, you could do it in 20 seconds oh, really? uh, out of a minute. But he showed me how to do it and the steps and everything to make sure I didn't get my hands where they weren't supposed to go or anything. And, and while we're doing it, he's telling me things like, Are you, where did you park? Well, I described and he said, oh, you want to park here tomorrow. It's a lot shorter. Come in this door that's labeled like this. He pointed out the building columns he had numbers and letters on them. He had no idea what those were. So you could find numbers went this direction, letters went that direction, so you could find your way through the maze. I mean, just the basic things where the restrooms were, when the siren blew, it was time for a break and for lunch. and Nothing that the management of the company did to help orient a new employee yeah. to, to the work environment. And, and that had a very lasting impression on me as, like I, as I would progress through different roles in the company and remembering back what my first day was like compared to what others they that we're confronted with were like. So yeah, it's uh, the world has changed <laughs> sometimes. <Yeah. laughs> sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, because we'll get, even when we have people come through and come through our workshops, we'll get not quite, but similar type of stories with yeah. that. So with that, thank you for sharing that. Um, can you tell us kind of how things evolved that you got to, you know, the, to come to the conclusion that you need to build something, which ultimately became the SWE, in yeah. order to, to... Probably should give some background to how we got to that yeah. point. Uh, in the 1990s, General Motors uh, was embracing what it called its uh, global manufacturing system. It, it was an operating system that was modeled after the Toyota production system. Uh, was being embraced and, and executed much more effectively overseas than domestically. Uh, we had models, the Cami operation, a joint venture with Suzuki and Ingersoll, Ontario. Uh, Eisenach, Germany is probably our best model. Poland, Rosario, Argentina, Brazil, China, Thailand. Uh, true team concept and lean principles being executed to an operating system very, very effectively but had not been successful in doing it anywhere in North America, uh, in the United States, in a UAW environment. We yeah. did have it in Cami in, in Ontario. Uh, our, our manufacturing executives thought that the best opportunity to do that would be in a, one of the Lansing operations, uh, specifically Local 652, uh, that had historically the Oldsmobile operation uh, back in the days of the bodies and and drivetrains, uh, Fisher Body Fisher had body, the, okay. the carriage works, Oldsmobile back as far back as autos go in the country. 1903 Curve Dash Olds was from that operation. From that area, so that's that's around the, the original Fisher's Body. Yeah, was Fisher, from that Fisher area. Body operation, and, and and then the Oldsmobile was the carry was the yeah. the drivetrain, the powertrain. Uh, this particular local had the Oldsmobile carriage. Uh, it also had a stamping plant uh, that was associated with it. Uh, we were coming into an environment that had a history of success and, and pride of its history. A very, very successful operation. Uh, but we wanted to implement some new concepts that were different. The team concept was not there yet. And uh, I think you mentioned once before maybe that um, when we'd spoken previously that there was like the people there were like multi-generational um, employees? Yeah. yeah, the vice chairman of the uh, negotiating committee was a third generation. His father had worked at the plant, his grandfather had worked at the plant. We had some cases of four generations. Wow. So, you know, it was a proud tradition. And we had to be careful that we weren't, we're saying we're not going to change, we're not going to undo this. We just want to open the pages to the next chapter. We have the opportunity to be even better. And here's the tools we'd like to do that with. Uh, to implement that change was going to take people that had grown up generationally in one way of operating, you know, the yeah. culture, the way we do things yeah, around here is, is your culture. And we wanted 
to take that another step. Uh, people had the right to do that by all of the different union agreements and seniority agreements that they had. Uh, but we wanted people to come that wanted to truly be in that new environment. Uh, so the concept was evolving not around a training tool, but rather a selection tool, a self-selection tool. A and I credit uh, a number of people with that. Ken Knight, who was our system plant manager yeah. who had worked at the Eisenach plant. Yeah, we actually had, Came, he did an article, we, him and I wrote an article together, mostly him on, yeah. on kind of sharing that story that we have available as well. Yeah, Ken came up with the concept. Uh, Chris Ryofsky, who was a part of our, our plant staff, who had started as an hourly employee with the Ford Flat Rock Mazda operation, okay. and it worked his way up, but been in Spain, and a, a lot of good lean experience, but from the ground, from the ground yeah. up. Uh, he and Ken would work back and forth as we were working out of a project center in Pontiac before the plant was well known or even public, driving back and forth, uh, working on the phone, coming up with, you know, how could we do this? And Ken had the ideas. Chris actually did the standardized work documentation okay. of, of how it was operating. And then the mechanics of it were, it was a fellow Joe Reichert that worked out of the project center in Pontiac, working rather surreptitiously with the skilled trades in Lansing to actually cobble up the thing using some old roller conveyors and yeah. you know carpenters with the plywood and so it sounds uh, like it was a very iterative step process as yeah they very much this. And, but the idea was let's put people through some kind of a simulated environment so they can see what we're going to expect them to learn how to do we're going to teach them to to do their own work balancing uh, we weren't going to have industrial engineers that was going to say, here's your job, follow these instructions. No, we're going to give you the tasks. And within your team and your fellow team members, you're going to learn how to balance those work elements out to optimize your effort and, and be as efficient as you can. Uh, the team structure and the role of the team leader, the, the servant leader, if you will. Yeah. How do we support people to make sure they do their right job, they do their job right the first time every time? Uh, and if that was a kind of environment that they wanted to be a part of, exercise your rights. If you really don't want to be a part of that, do us both a favor and stay yeah. away. And that was the self-selecting process you self mentioned a moment yeah. ago. So we actually had meetings at the Union Hall that uh, Art Baker, who is the fourth person, I have to give Art credit, he was a shop chairman. Uh, he had the vision to see where the future of the industry was going and realized that, that he wanted his people to be at the leading edge of that. Uh, so we he held meetings at the Union Hall and said, anybody interested in this new place that we're going to be building, come to one of these meetings and hear about it. So we presented what the basics of, of, of the shop rules. We hadn't negotiated them yet, but ultimately there were hundreds of classifications in that local. Yeah. We got down to, to four skilled trades from over 100. That's, that's, qu that's quite a feat. Yeah, team member and team leader from an operating standpoint, uh, and said, here's the kind of things you'll be learning how to do in the kind of environment we'd like you to live in. We're gonna teach you how to do it, and we're gonna take this good operation to the next step. But we're gonna pay you to go through a day of this simulation before you exercise your transfer rights. Okay. So, so while you're doing that from the, from, with the local union and the, the leadership there, they're also working from the functional side on developing this, I guess in a way, a process in order to, for those things to come together at some point. Come together in what sense? As, the, as they're gonna bring, they weren't gonna bring people through to self-select, but you need this process which becomes oh, a simulator yeah, yeah, something in order for, for people to see. to see, do, to understand, yeah. to make the decision. Yeah, because it's, you know, you, you, you tell people, you can read a book, yeah, but unless you're doing it, you know, working, working the line, I'll use a NUMI experience. Uh, General Motors cycled literally hundreds of people through NUMI to learn how the Toyota production system operated. And my experience, most of them, many, not, many were very successful and tried to bring the ideas back, but most came back to their home units. Yeah. And, and that environment just sucked them right back. Well, that might work over there for them, but it doesn't work here. You know, that's not how we do it in Missouri. That's not how we do it down here in Louisiana. Yeah, well, you're right, just without experience. And that's one thing we, to this day, with the way we're using the simulator, we experience that is, you know, we have videos online, we have description online, photos, and all that. And most people say, 
you know, until I actually got here, saw it and started u using it, could I really grasp what it, what it is? Yeah. Yeah, I think I got the first, the first hint that we had the opportunity of being successful when the concept was being presented to the local 652 before it was public. Uh, the idea was being kicked around and said, hey, if we can figure out a way to build a plant in existing space that we don't have to buy, if we can get this new product approved, if we can get the operating agreement to line up with it, get support from the local community from a you know a tax structure and so yeah. forth. Uh, let's see if we can do it. Well, the first step was to approach the union and say, "Are you willing to consider this?" Yeah. So, uh, I, I was taken to Lansing with the manufacturing manager that I was assigned to at the time, Tim Lee. And we met at the local 652 Union Hall, and I mean, it's typical Union Hall. Walked in, and sort of the boardroom and the lower level. Walked in, and typical shop committee guys looking like you and me, some looking like biker dudes, and yeah. just nice, good, hardworking people. And Art Baker and his uh, his executive committee walked in and sat down, and everybody just came to and said, "I understand you have something you want to share with us today," and we presented what the proposal was. I said, here's what we want to do. You know, we're gonna, we want to teach people how to do line balancing, manage their own work, use a true team concept. We're not gonna have any absentee pool. The team will replace itself for absentees and vacations. We're gonna be staffed to do that. And it was like, you know, I really had experienced the whole gamut of union relations yeah. and didn't know what, quite what to expect. Yeah. Uh, but it was just silence. And Art looked around, he said, anybody have any questions? And there were a couple, there were good insightful questions, we answered them. Anything else? No. And he said, okay, we'll, we'll be getting back to you. And that was it. I mean, no hollering, no screaming, no, no way that's <laughs> gonna happen here. It's just very professional. So we're getting out to leave and Art comes and he taps me on the shoulder. He said, hey Anderson, come out here. I wanna talk to you for a second. I said, oh, okay, here comes the meeting after <laughs> yeah. the meeting. And he said, I know that this is pretty quiet, hush-hush stuff. He said, you, you don't have a place to work here or anything. He said, but if you're in Lansing and you need to make some phone calls or do some work, he said, I always have a place for you here in the Union Hall. I'm thinking, wow, this could work. Yeah. <laughs> this could work. Well, so good. So that was the beginning. Uh, the simulated work environment was, was a self-selection tool. We wanted people to see what their role could be in utilizing their years of experience of successfully building high quality vehicles. And, and you, and as you built this, put it, physically put it together, was there in the plant? It, it was on the site. On the site, it, it okay. Was, it was in part of the Oldsmobile assembly complex. Okay, because I know it was, an, so it was an older location, so there's yeah. probably what, different buildings and, and they've spread yeah. out oh, a yeah, little bit. Oh yeah, multiple buildings. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and we, we tore down a number of the old Oldsmobile operation buildings to be able to create space on that site for the Grand River plant. Uh, the concept, the lean, obviously, is everything is in support of the operator doing their job right the first time every time. Uh, so the operations we had around the world were optimized to support that operator or that part of the manufacturing process. So. Typically, there were four buildings. There is a body building, there is a paint building, there is a final assembly building, and there is an administration operation. Yeah. And they were optimized in shape and space and location to minimize effort, yeah. you know, wasted effort. Uh, so typically, they were sort of in a U shape or a circle around a small administration area so people could get out to help easily. But we didn't have that that luxury in Lansing, we were in a crux of the Grand River on this Oldsmobile site and tearing down some buildings that weren't needed anymore and we had to figure out how do we fit what we need to produce this new product within that existing space. Yeah, and you, like you said, that, that had been around, some of those facilities had been around Since for- Almost 100, 100 years. years, so. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, great experience, good, good people. You know, we talked about the culture of different organizations and different nationalities and that. Uh, one of the th 
two different things came to mind as we were going through the differences that I saw traveling and learning from others that were successful in having already implemented yeah. these lean concepts in an assembly plant. Uh, one was common clothing. You know, I'm, I'm wearing, I, I, yeah, Brad, I, I still that. fit in this 20 years <laughs> later. Uh, the, the clothes that were selected were uh, of colors were going to match what Cadillac was going to use in its advertising theme. So okay. it was black, white, and khaki. And that was a color we used on the exterior of the plant, if they chose okay. to use that in advertising. And, so, and the product was going to be the Cadillac? Cadillac CTS. CTS, okay. Was, was going to sort of the, the effort for Cadillac to join the big boys with the BMWs and Mercedes. Okay. And the testing was done in the Nürburgring in Germany. I mean, it was, it was a fine, fine product. And uh, the plant was, was focused around that. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of people were calling it the Cadillac plant early on because we didn't have a name. It, it didn't exist yet. And creating that identity was important. We didn't want to be the identity of Cadillac because plants are plants, you know, yeah. parts are parts. It, it could be a Cadillac today, it could be a Camaro tomorrow, we, who knew? Uh, during the course of the early construction, our construction manager was coming up with the idea of safety awards for the c contractors. And he came up with this little logo that used the, the loop and the Grand River. Yeah. And on a, the safety award t-shirt that he was going to be giving out. And I said, Dale, I said, I love the idea of the award, but I'm going to steal that logo. I said, <laughs> I, that, that's too good. I mean, that, that is exactly who we are. We had a contest. We're coming up with the name of the plant to identify that. And we ended up using Dale's logo with the crook of the Grand River. So that's, that's actually his logo there? Well, we had an artist make it, okay. make it look better. Okay. But that's where the idea came from. Uh, I lost the, lost the train of thought of where we were headed from that. Well, I know you were, you were talking about that the, the didn't really have a name of, a, of the oh, plant, yeah, yeah. and the people were calling so, it the Cadillac so, plant. So the different, difference in culture yeah. and how things adapt. Well, common clothing was protect the product from the people and protect people from the product. So whether it's Kevlar sleeves and gloves, you know, a belt that doesn't have a buckle on yeah. it so it doesn't scratch paint. Uh, coming up with what that suite of clothing was going to be, because we didn't have plants in North America that had a, a common clothing. It was people wear their blue jeans or yeah. whatever they wanted. We said, no, we want to identify with, with who we are. You know, this is who we are. This is who I am. Uh, so we got a small committee was selected what they were going to come up with and it, I was flabbergasted with how complex it became. <laughs> I mean, it was people that, well, I only wear short pants. I never wear long pants. Well, how about if it's 10 degrees outside? It doesn't matter. I wear short pants. Okay, we've got to have short pants. You know, I only wear black. I'm not going to wear any light colors on this big butt of mine. I said, <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it was, it was almost comical, but we yeah. got them to all agree on a combination of things that people in the office and people on the plant floor could wear and select from that, that we would provide for common clothing to protect them and protect the product. I counter that with what we did in the plant in China. Dennis Doherty was starting that up and you know, going to his workforce and saying, hey, we're going to provide common clothing. We, we think this would be a, a good color scheme. I was like, click your heels, salute, yes, sir, what's mm, next? What I mean, it was that easy, but they were used to being told what to do. Their culture yeah, was, yeah. was following instruction. It wasn't being engaged. We flipped that to practical problem solving when we took people through some of the lean concepts and trying to teach problem solving. Uh, the Lansing people, it, it was in their DNA. They'd been doing it for generations. For generations yeah. It was just natural. It was like, okay, let's keep this moving. Keep, we can go faster on this. We understand all this stuff. We've been doing it already. Uh, trying to implement that in the Chinese culture was, was very difficult because they they were not trained they were or raised to, to take initiative. No, 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 I, 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 can't, I can't start that. I mean, nobody's told me to do that. No, no, we're asking you to, how do you help? How do you, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I do. Well, it is now. So, you know, the difference in culture was, yeah. was amazing to see how the same idea on the surface, like reading a book, seems very natural and obvious, but trying to execute it within the existing culture environment is very, very different very depending on where you are. And you see that with, with the people that come sure. in to, to go through your training. Yeah, absolutely. 
So as as you as you how did how did the people take as you ran them through the simulator as that came up? I know you said you initially kind of looked at it as a kind of a self-selecting process. Yeah, it was a self-selecting process, and, and and I think we were surprised. Uh, I forget the exact numbers. Uh, I, I think Ken said in the article that he did with you it was about eighty percent, and it may have even been higher. Eighty percent of the people that went through it said, you know what. I like the job I'm doing. I like the choices I have now. I, I really don't want to go into that. Even though it's going to be a new plant, air conditioned, I just want to keep coming in and doing my job. Yeah. And that was good because that meant 80% of the people that were interested didn't come in and get frustrated. Yeah, yeah. Which because they would been, not have been happy. Been, wouldn't have been good for the plant, wouldn't yeah. have been good for them. Yeah. Uh, as we were going through that, then we saw. You know, there's benefit in refreshing the knowledge of the tools and also reinforcing the roles of that, that servant leader. Yeah. You know, the organization charts upside down. The, the leader's down at the bottom. He's the last point of support or she's the last point of support for everybody else. The operator, the one that's adding value to the product, is the most important person in the plant. And how do we all serve the support of, of helping that person do their job? Uh, so. Having Ken train our area managers that were responsible for each of those three major operations, and then their shift leaders and the group leaders going through the support and reinforcing what their role was because they had been working in the same operating system yeah. for decades, decades as well. And, and boy, what's in your head is, is hard to, to get out sometimes. Yeah. Uh, they didn't all have that same experience I did on the first day of job and saying, how can I avoid doing this at all costs? Uh, so you were able to use the simulator for that role as well then? Yeah, for, for taking people back through, a you know, for, for sort of a refresher. And some took two or three tries before they really settled in and, and, and acknowledged, yeah, I, I can support harder instead of grabbing a hold tighter. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it really does work. The people are capable. I just have to help them be capable. So also too, you said with going through the simulator is about a 80 percent uh, self deselecting yeah. from that environment. Were you able to get enough with the 20 percent? Oh yeah, it was, to, it was a massive to populate operation. the plant. Okay, you know, thousands and thousands of employees, and we were, you know, we were starting out with hundreds. Okay, uh, so there are many, many people that were interested. Uh, and had no difficulty at all, but the ones that came were enthusiastic because they saw the opportunity and they said, you know, I've, I've wanted to do this for 20 years. Yeah. People, you know, how do I get my ideas to be heard? Okay. And I suppose the simulator would help make it ta more tangible to them to be excited, to understand as they came into the plant yeah. as you ramped up. So did, it, you, did you continue to use the simulator as the plant ramped up or over it was. time? It, it, it was. Uh, once the plant was operating, uh, the need for that was was not there because we had real life experiences and quite sure. frankly launching a brand new product and a brand new plant is you know drinking from a fire hose <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so it you know we had the real life experiences and and they weren't all they weren't all good i mean you, you, we're humans we make yeah. mistakes uh, for the we had beliefs and values that we said we're going to we're going to live to uh, at the staff meetings we'd have on Friday was, I forget somebody I think sarcastically called it Anderson's devotionals, but we <laughs> we take the belief and values list and every on, on a flimsy, and I'd put a little mark next to the next one. We say, okay, we're going to start the meeting out with somebody give me an example. Last week where you demonstrated that value, you know, something that you did with somebody or some organization where you were successful because. That was in the back of your mind. And that everybody's proud to give an example if they thought of one. And they say, okay, now where'd you screw up? Had you been thinking of that, you would have behaved differently, but you didn't. And it was tough at first, but People like it, it was good because it reminded us that we were still learning and growing as an organization. Let's see. So yeah. did, did the simulator, did, did it stay at the plant or did it eventually go somewhere else as you guys ramped up and then didn't need us as much or much just because you were work, yeah. working in an environment? I, I know when I retired, uh, d just as we were getting ready to launch the third product, the, it was still there. 
But when, when, but when was that? Uh, 19, uh, 2002. Okay, so it had been there for 10? Three years. Okay. Yeah, okay, 1999, 90s, 90s. 2000 okay. uh, was when we were active on the site. Uh, but it really wasn't being used then. And, and I know Ken had the background. He took my place in the plant and, and others since then as it moved on. Okay. But I know they're all over now. Yeah, as you say, did, so did you guys have any inkling that, that General Motors would take this and propagate it throughout their organization? Not at the time, but others Because others you, you were just focused on you guys' tasks, yeah. I suppose, you had at hand. And, and I, I know Ken and Chris often said, boy, if we were smart, we would have just put this, like you had in your article, we'd just put this in a semi-trailer. <laughs> We'd have a place to Tahiti by now. Yeah. yeah.